baptism is. Baptism is done for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. Baptism is done to save us, 1 Peter 3.21, Acts 2.40, Mark 16.16. Trust in the Lord with all your hearts, and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. Josh Herring is a preacher, teacher, and the author of the book, Fast Forward, available in Kindle and paperback edition on Amazon. Hello, my friend, Brother Herring. How are we doing? Man, I'm excited to be with you. Thank you for having me. Um, thank you for your warm introduction, and uh, I'm glad you're on Fast, man. How's, how's the Fast going so far? <laughs> Well, I, I'm breaking one of your rules. You're not supposed to tell people about it. So uh, yeah. we already got, <laughs> we got no, a stri- hey. we got a strike against us. <laughs> it's okay. Hey, you got things that are going to happen because of it. Well, you're I'm just saying. Fighting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, normally I would never do that, but the context of what we're talking about here, it's okay. It's fasting. Yes. Yeah. Well, congratulations on this book. Uh, I just love the format of it, the layout of it. Thank it you. is uh, spectacular. You're a phenomenal writer. August of 2020, and you mentioned you were writing a book, and you called it Fast Forward. And hmm. so here we are, man. Uh, welcome done. back to the podcast. Well, yeah. it's an honor to be with you, man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I assure you the pleasure is all mine. In your book, it's, okay. it's in a, a several places, but kind of noteworthy to me on page three, page, page 97. You mentioned multiple times that fasting really will help you hear the voice of God. It turns the volume of the world down. So tell us, how does an empty belly make God louder and the world quieter? Mm. Such a great, uh, I love the way you said that, how the empty belly make the, make the Lord louder. Um, there's, <laughs> I'll use Bible for everything I can here on these questions tonight. Um, uh, the two that come to mind was the, when Moses fasted his first fast, which was 40 days. In fact, he's the first person we, we find fasting in the Bible, although Job probably fasted before Moses did because he did mention in his, uh, Moses wrote the book of Job, and, but uh, it mentions that Job said he, uh, he esteemed the words of the Lord more than his necessary food. But, um, but Moses is the first person reported fasting. So he fasts 40 days, which is an amazing feat to be for your first fast, first recorded fast to go that long. He comes off the mountain uh, to the to the people worshiping the golden calf and the picture of carnality in the world. He breaks the Ten Commandments, and you know the story. And God, uh, God calls him back to the mountain again. Um, and this time, um, God tells him, don't let anything come near the mountain. Don't let any human, don't let any animal, uh, let, let, let there be no sound as you're approaching me. Um, I, I wonder if Moses got distracted by the sound when he was coming down the mountain of the people the first time because he got so angry at what he was hearing and what he saw mm. that he, he lost out on what he had just achieved. He, he, um, he basically Uh, stepped away from everything he had stepped into. And so this time, God makes this very strong declaration. He says, this time when you approach me, I don't want any sound near you. I don't want any human. Don't come near me listening for my voice, distracted by other voices. Uh, Because if you really want to hear from me, uh, the greatest way to hear from me is to turn down the volume of everything else around you. So when Moses went on his second fast, uh, he was in utter silence, and and ultimately God shows him his hinder parts, or which you know we we are we believe is creation. And Moses wrote the book of Genesis, sure. and he had to, he had to uh, write all these things and know all these things from something. And so when God said, "I will show you my hinder parts," that's my past. And so he 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 gets a visual or a, a, some kind of. 40 days of hearing and seeing all these things God had done. But the first thing God told him was, you know, turn down the volume of the world around you. And uh, that's one, that's one that comes to mind. Um, Another one in the Bible, Eli, 
No, he doesn't say he was, he had an eating problem, the priest Eli, but it did say he was very heavy. Uh, and when God came down and spoke to Samuel, the child, in the temple, and Samuel could not figure out who was talking to him, multiple times God called Samuel. Samuel, Eli was asleep, and Samuel came to Eli and, and ultimately said, you know, I'm hearing this voice. And Eli knew what the voice of God sounded like. But he also knew God was no longer talking to him. Um, he was talking in the same under the same roof, but no longer talking to Eli. Mm. Uh, and all we know is that Eli knew how to hear God, but wasn't actually hearing God for himself. And the only thing we know about Eli's physical body was that he was very heavy. Now he might have had something wrong with him, but uh, most likely there was some kind of lack of consecration in his life, lack of discipline in his life. So therefore, he he mm. knew how to hear God, but he was not necessarily hearing God for himself. I, I really think that the Lord, uh, when 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 you are fasting, it forces your brain to think differently than when you're feeding it on a constant base, feeding your body mm. uh, sugars, carbs, different things. So your brain is automatically thinking different. And when you would naturally go to the fridge or the pantry to for that afternoon snack, and you cannot do that because you're on a fast, it, it, you, your thought process is different. You might pick up a Bible or a book and you begin to read. So you begin to think differently and therefore you open up patterns of how what you're listening to. I, you know, I really think that when, when people turn down the volume of the world, uh, it's very, very easy to hear from God. God doesn't stop talking. I, 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 I talk to my children uh, hundreds of times a day, I make different statements to my children. Um, I, I don't sit there and go silent on them all day long. I speak to them throughout the day. And whether they hear me or not, that's a different story. But I do speak mm. to them on a continual basis yeah, daily. Me too. Uh, yeah. And so when I, you know, our, our father speaks all the time. It's just that sometimes we have other things going. We're distracted. And Whoa. so fasting is one of the easiest ways to hear from God. If you, if you, if God's not talking to you right now, it's probably because you're distracted with something that is keeping you from hearing his voice because he truly is speaking. You just have to turn the volume down. Mm. Wow. Fasting forces the brain to think differently. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's deep. You wrote a lot of great personal experiences in fasting. And right from the get-go in the book, just those first few pages are worth the entire uh, mm -hmm. price of the book. You talk about your first fast longer than, uh, uh, I think it was seven days, if I remember right. But you were, it was early on in your marriage, mm -hmm. and it, you, you went through kind of a dry season. That's kind of an evangelist mm -hmm. phrase. Uh, can you just give us a little teaser about that story? It really inspired yeah. you to go longer. I think it was a week. Yeah, we fasted. Uh, well, we, my wife and I had been married six, six months almost at that time. And I, uh, I had been evangelizing. Hmm, oh, I'm going to, it had been six or seven years. And so when I, when I. Um, Shout out to, to uh, Sister Herring, by the way. Yes, yes, an amazing lady who's helping take care of these kids while I do this tonight. Uh, there's, you know, it was a it was a dry season because uh, you know, Christmas time is it's usually not the greatest season for uh, a young evangelist um, uh, because people are doing Christmas plays, churches are very busy, and and so we had this dry season where we didn't have very many um, weekends booked during you know late November, early December, and. We had uh, we had uh, some tuna fish and I think some green beans in the pantry, and mm. uh, what actually what actually <laughs> started this it was actually it was actually the uh, the Lord used Brother Stone King, uh, Brother Stone King called me, and he said you heard my friend Steve Willoughby is sick with cancer and I said yeah and he said um, I'm too old to fast too weak to go on a fast. If I pray, will you fast? And when he said that, I I already I was already in this dry season, and I thought, you know what? Uh, I've heard that fasting changes everything. I'm going to just go beyond my limit. I'm going to go, and I went, um, I believe, ten days, and 
And I got all the proof I needed, you know, that fasting works because on the ninth day, uh, I got a call to, uh, and my wife and I transitioned to Florida. We got a call from a pastor in Florida who wanted us to come down and start preaching at his church and move down there. And ultimately, in the next three years, we saw almost 3,000 people receive the Holy Ghost. And that's just at his church on one Sunday a month services. And and there were several, I would say over 2,000 were baptized in Jesus' name. In fact, uh, it was it was more baptisms at first than, than Holy Ghost. It was just, it was an interesting sure. ordeal. And so um, that season right there catapulted my life into having faith that God does hear you when you're at, when you hit the wall and there's nothing you could do. I was out of resources. I had called people, no one, you know, it was, there, it was no way I could go book myself to preach anywhere. And, and uh, it's one thing when you're single, but when you have a, a spouse to take care of and, mm-hmm. and, you, and you, you can't provide. So I ran out of options and, and when you run out of options, you know, that's usually a signal you have not, um, chase down the ultimate option first. And so I, I, I just made up my mind, I'm going to chase Jesus and I'm going to do this fast. And if I, I don't, if nothing happens, nothing happens, but I'm going to end, I'm going to go out uh, this year, believing God for more. And so that, that ultimately was the, uh, you know, my wife, I remember she ate the green beans and ate the tuna fish. Well, it was, it was a very, very tight time financially. And, and she uh, she just held on in faith while I uh, believed God, and, and uh, it, it worked. Wow, what a story. You called it in your book, that was a signal to fast. Mm-hmm. When you looked around, mm-hmm. no direction, no resources. Mm. What do you do? Turn to the Lord. Mm. Yeah, I, be- I feel strongly that when you... Uh, uh, when you cannot fix it and when you have done everything you can do and you've tried to figure it out and usually this takes days and weeks and sometimes months, whatever your situation is, usually there's a fast calling you. Um, it's, it's the, it, you know, Jesus said some things only happen by prayer and fasting. This kind go without out, but by prayer and fasting. Yes. And so there's some things only happen. Some breakthroughs only happen. When you make up your mind, I'm going to fast. I'm not going to feed my flesh any longer. I'm going to hear God. I'm going to find out what God is doing. You know, Ezra, that that reminds me of the book of Ezra when he called the fast at the river Ahava. And he literally called everybody on a fast. And the Bible said he did that so that they could find a way for their families and for their children. He, they literally were trying to find the pathway and he, he called a fast for everyone so that the Lord would lead them on, on, on the path that their families were supposed to go on. So you have Bible, uh, you have evidence in the word of God, throughout the word of God, of people that when they needed an answer, um, in fact, the greatest fast you'll go on are fast where you need direction or you need an answer from the Lord. Um, because mm-hmm. these things... You know, a lot of times, and I'm, this is not going to be very popular, but a lot of times people uh, say, you know, fasting is, is crucifying the flesh. And I say that it is true. But oftentimes in the Bible, fasting was for a need, a situation. Absolutely. Yeah. And so more than just crucifying the flesh, when I talk about going on extended fast, you know, a three-day fast will usually get your flesh in subjection pretty quick. But anytime you get called to a long <laughs> fast, there needs to, there usually is a need involved. Uh, mm-hmm. That's, that's greater than just your flesh being crucified. Yes. We've got a lot of listeners. Okay. That, well, all, all ages, young and old, but a lot of listeners are 18 to 25 years old. And that's a, a time in your life when you really, you, you're really needing direction. You know, you're leaving youth becoming an adult, you've got school on your mind, career on your mind, getting married on your mind. And would you say things like that, a fast could really help somebody get direction on if they're supposed to marry this person or not, if they're supposed to go to this school or not, if they're supposed to take this job or not? One thousand percent. I mean, uh, that's the same advice I I give uh, young preachers all the time what that call me looking for direction um, you need to fast your way into the 
into the answer. There's so many stories in the Bible where fasting was for direction. And I, I truly think that it goes back to your first question, hearing the voice of God. What is God wanting you to do? What is God asking you to do? That Those are, those are things that happen only from fasting. And so I, I, I truly believe that if you're a young person, you're trying to find your way. And back to that Ezra, you know, that Ezra, it's chapter 8, verse 21 through 23. Um, and it literally says, I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava. We might afflict ourselves before God to seek of him a right way for us and for our little ones and for all our substance. And he said, I was ashamed to ask the king basically for help. And but then he said, so we fasted in verse 23. We besought the Lord and he was entreated of us. So he said, all, we were all looking for direction. I was embarrassed to ask people what to do. So the only thing I knew was to was to fast. And he said, and God heard what we were fasting for. So if you're if you're if you're wanting God to tell you what path to take. Um, do, do something to get God's attention. You know, what are you doing to get God's attention right now? If, it, what, what are you doing to, to get God to move in your situation? I know you can sit there and say, I'm waiting on the Lord, but but we're all waiting on the Lord. What, what are you doing while you wait on him? What are you? What kind of fire are you starting? What kind of sacrifice is on your altar? How big is your altar? What, what are you doing uh, in, in preparation for what you're expecting God to do? So I think that, the, the you know, Showing God you're serious. Uh, there's there's fewer there's few greater ways to show God you're serious about His direction in your life than fasting. It, there's very few. Uh, I, I don't know of any of more painful to the flesh things you can do uh, than than fasting. It's it's the ultimate. I'm dead serious, God. This is all I can do to get your attention for what I need you to tell me to do. Yes, it is. It's. I like to think of it, you're going back to the beginning. The first sin that mankind ever did was by what he ate. Correct. And as a way you're saying, you know, as, as Adam and Eve should have said, no, I'm saying no now to food. Mm-hmm. So that's uh, I think that is profound because we think of fasting as something that preachers do for direction and evangelists and missionaries do to have mm-hmm. revival. But mm-hmm. fasting can open the door for the voice of God for some of the key choices that you have to make in your life oh so without a doubt your education your marriage mm-hmm. things like that and then of course a you know, a man who's middle-aged our age wife mm-hmm. kids where, where to go with the family what to do for the family mm-hmm. a fast will mm-hmm. force your brain to think mm-hmm. differently uh, to hear the voice of the lord great illustration by the way you're always talking to your kids and <laughs> they oh. don't always listen <laughs> yes <laughs> and, and that's yeah. the way it is we're children in the eyes of God. Yeah. You brought out some really good insight into a lot of Bible passages, but specifically on pages 21 to 23, 27 to 28, you talked about Esau and also the young prophet from Judah. Mm. Both of these men had the opportunity to say no to food, but because Mm. they ate, it, uh, drastically affected their future Mm -hmm. so and you make the point don't focus on the current fast the current situation but rather focus on what is to come what is to Mm -hmm. come after the fast and uh yeah i think a lot of us do that nowadays it's uh it's the key to remaining steadfast. And I know you talked about uh, motivation is really not how you're going to keep the fast going at all. It's really no. determination. So my question is, yes. so focusing on yes. what follows the fast is essential to remaining steadfast in it. Yes. Um, the, the way I like to tell people though, when I'm talking to them is this, start your fast. If, if, now this, when I'm talking about fast, I'm talking about extended fast that, you know, where there's a need involved. The only way you're going to last long on a fast is to start at the finish line. Meaning, um, if you are starting your fast focused on how miserable it is, how long you have to go, how uh, hungry you are, uh, is is anything going to change? 
um, you're most likely not going to last very long um, because you're already losing the mental battle um, of, of what's ahead. And when I say start the finish line, um, you need to enter every fast completely full of faith that what I'm fasting for is going to happen. So I'm going to complete this amount of days. I'm going to, I'm already seeing myself at day 20 or at day 10 or at day 30 or whatever it is that you're going. I'm not seeing myself on day two right now or day one. I'm seeing myself at the end of it because what I'm fasting for in the future has so much more value than what I'm struggling with in the present. It's like, you know, when you think about what you're pursuing and you, th and that's why I tell people, Brother Gleason, you need to have something big enough worth fasting long about. Because if the wow. devil can pull you off the fast within 24 hours, either you don't believe what, what you want to believe God can do, or, or you really aren't uh, putting God to the test. If if you're if you can fast for something and get the answer within two hours, uh, it's probably not very big. You need to have something that you cannot make happen with your connections, with your finances, with your resources, and yet know it's from God. And then that's why I tell people to put a list when they fast. Write a list down of things, not that you hope for, but that you fully believe. God will do. Now, let me back up and say this. Fasting does not twist the arm of God to give you something, but fasting does position you to receive the favor of God. Fasting brings things to you. That's why the book is called Fast Forward. It brings things from your future into your present. Things that maybe you would not be ready enough to receive for three or four years or five years will manifest this year in your life because you complete a fast and you sacrifice. There's something about getting God's attention. And so when you have something big enough worth fasting long about, you're starting at the finish line. You're already looking at the future saying, if I can hold on, if I can go through this excruciating trials, seven days, 14 days, 40 days, whatever it is. On the other side of this is everything I need, everything I'm Amen. fully Come waiting on. on, the destiny. Uh, you know, uh, I, I tell people that in between your dream and your destiny is, is a road that only discipline can travel down. Discipline is the vehicle that travels and takes you from dreams into destiny. So you can daydream about your future all your life and ultimately never see it. But when you step into fasting, you're declaring, I demand answers. I demand what I, the promises to start manifesting. I am stepping out of the flesh and into the spirit. You've made statements to me that you're never more like an angel than when you're fasting. So when you are, when you are fasting, you are becoming spirit. You are you are literally killing flesh and becoming spirit, and you are very very connected to the will of God. Let me just say this, and I, I hope this is okay. But I really just want to. I feel it's very like, okay. Okay, I preached a message recently called "The Scent of Sincerity," and I was praying, and the Lord spoke to me that the sincere prayer is what He desires the most out of anything—a sincere prayer. And when I began to study the word sincere, I realized that sincere is uh, in the Greek, in the book of Philippians, this word is literally, uh, it says to be tested by the sunlight, to be judged by the rays of the sun, to be tested as genuine. When something is sincere, according to Philippians in, in, the, in the Greek, it's tested by time. The light of the day determines how sincere the prayer request was, okay? So when you get up in the morning and you pray, God, I really need you to do this today, and then your actions all day long don't reflect what you prayed, what you actually said was, God, I wasn't really sincere about what I asked because my actions are saying, as you're testing my prayer, when you release a prayer, of course, Revelation 5, Revelation 8, and those prayers are taken up before the Lord as 
as a, as a fragrance, they are dropped off before the Lord. When you pray that, when you release that, those prayers go before his throne. But when you are doing other things all day long and not, not connecting to what you prayed, then your prayer was really not sincere. Now, why am I saying this? What does this do with fasting? It's very simple. Fasting is like fuel to a fragrance. It's like when someone, it's like you can get on an elevator at a hotel. Someone could have just been on that elevator with some kind of perfume or cologne on. You don't even see that person. They're not on the elevator any longer, but you can smell what they're wearing because they were in the room. That's what fasting does to a prayer. When you pray something that's sincere and serious, it's a fragrance that comes before God. But when you fast about what you prayed, the fragrance doesn't leave the room. It stays in his nostrils. It's like you're still there in front of him saying, Lord, I need you to come through in this situation. You've stopped praying. You're doing something else. But because you're fasting, fasting is keeping the fragrance of the prayer alive. And all God, because God not only yeah. hears our prayers, he smells our prayers. And so that's that's why they're 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 literally odors, the Bible calls them for him. So he smells the motive of what I'm asking for. So if he's continually smelling a sacrifice, it's difficult for him to say no to the request because the scent of uh, fasting is keeping the request right in front of him. Mm. Oh, that's deep. If he saw what I said no to Jacob's offer, he'd have had the birthright. Totally different outcome. Totally uh, different outcome. If Eve says no to the food, you know, uh, totally different outcome. It's mm-hmm. it's the first temptation Satan brought to Jesus. You know, eat. Uh, it, it's it's oh, it's just man. something. It's something. Uh, the devil knows the power of food, and um, and I really believe. Yeah, and you that said uh, when you're fasting, your pizza will be talking to you. Come eat it me. Sure does. <laughs> he said that in the book. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> and isn't it funny how when you fast everybody and their brother calls you with some kind of brand hey I'm, I'm coming by your house with this box of Krispy Kreme donuts so it's, it's, it's funny how when you start fasting food appears out of nowhere yes. people bake cookies you know uh, it's it's amazing how people bring bring stuff to your home you know they just want to bless you in fact once at one time I was on a fast and someone said they brought this massive uh, amount of food to our home and they stayed literally t- I was on I forget I was on day oh I don't know 16 or 17 and they they told my wife at the door the Lord told me to bring this food to your home and I wanted to laugh I thought the Lord didn't tell you that at oh, all the devil goodness. told me to do that yes and so it was it was interesting but yeah it's so interesting wow how our choices determine what we're actually going to receive it's just like the the young prophet from Judah Headed mm. up to Judge Jeroboam on his way back. The the old prophet yes. offered him food. He's yeah. <laughs> the, the young prophet said, "Nope." God said, "Don't eat." Mm-hmm. In wow. fact, he said, "An angel told me." And you know what's so sad about that story is the Lord told the young prophet, "Don't eat," and the old prophet said, "An angel told me you're supposed to eat." And Paul said, "If if you preach anything or in any other angel anything, let him be accursed." And and the and the the secret with the, that the young prophet missed was that he said, "I've heard from God directly," and the old man said, "I've heard from a messenger of God." That's it. And, and he so he he aborted a word directly from God for a third word from God, quote unquote, that someone else said. And, and of course, the word was you know eat, and um, and he lost everything. And he was gifted, Brother Gleason. He was yeah. so powerful. That young prophet was so powerful and that's why fasting is is fasting is very real you know and i've told you i think i may have mentioned on on your first podcast but uh that i did with you but you know when you fast you grab the attention of the spirit world you know daniel uh daniel 10 daniel 9 daniel 10 you read that especially in daniel 10 when you see the prince of persia the demon and the and and the angels fighting michael coming in to help and the prince of grecia and the prince of persia both trying to stop one man on a fast, you know, hell aborting their post in a different nation over one guy fasting. That tells you how serious hell takes fasting. If yes. Satan himself shows up, you know, uh, to Jesus on a fast, 
you know, this, this ought, if, if this ought to tell you how serious it is in the spirit world, heaven and hell, both are at attention when you push the plate away instantly. They know something's about to change in your life. Mm. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost. Wow. Yeah, it's, it just came in the call, yes. Oh, man. The first time I ever heard about you, Brother Herring, was from our mutual friend, Pastor John Martin in Muncie. Mm. Indiana. Shout out to Brother Martin and the entire family. Yes, love him. Oh, yes. He's great. I ought to get him on this podcast. You should. <laughs> I, 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 but I got to tell you, I've never had a serious conversation with him. He's awesome. <laughs> it's hard to have a serious laugh. conversation with him. <laughs> no, can we can make have. you laugh. Oh, man. He knows the joy of the Lord, pastoring a phenomenal, phenomenal church. Yes. You you write about him in in the book, and I was so happy to pleased to see his name come up in the book. And he is connected to your first fast of forty days, page seventy nine to eighty. Okay, and tell yes. us that story. How how all yeah. that happened? Yes, you know. So I I'm on this course trying to go on these long fasts after that ten day fast that I told you about earlier in the podcast. Mm-hmm. I really wanted to go longer, and, and I the, made the tuna it. fish and green beans one. Yes, yes, <laughs> you know, and I and I and I made it eight days, and I made it nine days, mm. and then and then I made the it uh, eleven, wow. yeah, eleven and Direction. twelve days, and, yeah, and thirteen days, and each time I'd fast, I would get I'd go one day longer on eleven day. I was trying to go fourteen, I went eleven, then I was trying to go. Uh, uh, 14 again, and I went 12 the next time. The next time I was trying to go 14 again, and I, I got to 13, and the Lord called me off it. And I was so frustrated. It was it was uh, 2013, and I had gone 13 days in January, and I was and I was it was uh, I forget when it was uh, the time of the year, but I do know my wife was pregnant with our. Well, I can I can tell you exactly when it was. Now that's uh, coming back to me. It was it was in. Uh, June and the Lord was talking to me and uh, towards the end of June and about fasting. And I thought, I'm not going to be able to break beyond this. I've tried, I've tried so much to do this. And so end of June went by in July, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm praying and preaching and I uh, preached on, uh, on a Sunday, a couple of services. And I was driving home that night uh, with my wife and, and uh, John Martin called and he said, hey, I want to tell you what I preached today. And I said, well, what did you preach today? And he said, I preached about Mount Everest. And I said, that's awesome. He said, did you know you can only climb to the top of Everest three, uh, three weeks out of the calendar year? I said, what do you mean? He said, there's, there's this death zone. Uh, they call it the death zone near the top of Everest. The weather is so severe that it doesn't open up for you to get to the very top, except for the last weekend in April the first week of May and the week in October. And even on those uh, particular weeks, you have to be, have a guide. You have to have someone down at your base camp telling you, okay, the weather's open. In fact, most people that climb Everest, you know, the max, you can actually stay on the top is about 20 minutes. Uh, There are dead bodies all over Mount Everest. And if you've ever ever seen any documentaries about it, uh, it's just, it's, it'll, it'll change your life. There people go up and bring dead bodies down and crazy stuff. But, Anyway, so he says that he's telling me that that there's only these three weeks out of the year that you can get to the top. And as he's talking, it was like his voice disappeared. And the Lord spoke to me and said, you will go on a 40 day fast. You will start July 28th. You will end September 6th. I mean, just that quickly. I didn't calculate it. I I couldn't have I couldn't have told you that July 28th and September 6th was going to be, you know, uh, was going to be all that. So it was 40 days. So um, when I tell you that it was absolutely mind blowing and, and I thought, well, I mean, the longest I've ever fasted was 13 days. And, but sure enough, um, he called me to that and, uh, and I went 40 days, thank the Lord for his mercy and for his strength. And there was only one or two moments during that fast where I even got uh, remotely tempted to eat. It was one of those things where God carried me. Uh, he carried me and changed my life from that 40 day fast. He changed my life. Um, and if you're wondering what my big need was, I, I, when he called me into that, I said, okay, you know, we're, we're pregnant with our first child. And so I said, God, I want this to be for my son. 
I want this fast to be for his future, mm. for his calling. Uh, I don't want him to fight the, the things I had to fight, et cetera. Jesus. I want him to have victory. And so it was big enough. It was easy to stay on it when there's uh, when there's a family member at stake. Um, it's easier to stay on it when, wow. when there's someone you love that it's really easy for the Gleason to stay on it. I mean, it, it's hard something at times. Big. I mean, yeah. yeah, it's something big, man. It's like, this is my baby involved. So, um, so that was the, uh, that was that. And that story, and it just, it was just so powerful. In fact, I have a mentoring group called Everest. Now there's 65 young preachers in it. And that, that, you know, we're, it's, it's from that phone call, that phone <laughs> call of, of, you know, just incredible, um, incredible moment there in fact i don't know if i put this in the book or not i, I don't remember but uh maybe i did and forgive me but i remember on the 40th night um uh, let's just go deep here on the 40th night i went to the church and the sanctuary had no windows and i remember two things on that night that that changed my life one was at one point i, I was praying and speaking in tongues i looked up and there were these uh what i would call they look like figures that were upside down triangles with heads or with lights just it was just they were all connected all over the walls they were dancing mm. it was like i believe there were angels of the lord all around the walls oh yes uh and um and they were just you know i'm not saying upside down triangles probably not a good way to describe but they were, they were i've seen them shaped so they look okay. like yeah. okay Diamonds. yeah okay mm -hmm. yes 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 it's a better way to describe it and so that was there and then uh, what was so crazy about Brother Martin was um, about 30 minutes before the fast ended, uh, I was about 11.30 and I had started on midnight on the 28th, 29th, whatever it was, 28th, entering the 29th of July. It was 30 minutes uh, from midnight and I was laying on the floor and all of a sudden this strong gift of tongues came through me. And I, I normally don't operate in the gift of tongues. Now, I have done some interpreting, but as far as releasing the tongues and it's not been really something i have been used in and it was like i was in a church service and someone would just you know a real silent moment and someone just released the strongest tongue you can fathom and i remember laying there after the tongues came through me and i thought well god uh, what's the interpretation and and I heard my phone ding, and I thought, "Well, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not looking at that right now. I'm very connected." And it and it dinged again to remind me, and it was a it was a picture that John Martin sent of someone on the top of Everest, and he said, "The Lord said, this is where you are right now. You've mm. made it." And out of nowhere, I mean, you could just feel a witness of the Holy Ghost. It was just like the Lord was letting you know, "I, I, I see it. I'm with you." And I've carried you here. And so, you know, I just want to encourage someone listening right now. When God calls you, he will carry you on these things. You know, you just keep having faith. You keep focusing on what's ahead of you, what's coming after the fast, because God's going to carry you through the fast. Yes, he will. Mm. And you would say that moment when Brother Martin called you that God was saying it's either now or never. You're never going to go on another 40 day fast unless you do it on these dates that I that I'm speaking to you. Yeah, he he opened the door uh, right then, and he basically said, "This is you know if you don't if you don't go now, you're never going to go." So I've asked him since then because I did obey you. Will you let me go again? You know, and so because I because he really it was that strongly. There was such there was such a uh, uh, an authority that came that if you don't take advantage of this moment, um, you will, you will miss out, you know? And, and so that's why the world, the, the voice of the world is so strong, uh, and, and so, and must be put to silence when, when you're, when you're pursuing something this big. And I want I was going to say this earlier, um, on your first question, but I'm going to say it now. Uh, my pastor showed me this, that in the book of Ezekiel, uh, one of the there's four major sins uh, from Sodom and Gomorrah that's mentioned in the book of Ezekiel. And those sins were and it's um, I'll find the text here. But the, uh, the sins in, in these two verses are uh, they were full of pride. They had fullness of bread 
which means overeating in the Hebrew. Mm -hmm. They they were they were at ease. They were lazy, and they did not care for the poor and needy. But the one that I want to focus on is that they are they had fullness of bread. You know, we think of Sodom and Gomorrah as all these wicked, sensual, sick spirits, and these and that was true. But something that, that the Lord was saying, He noticed about Sodom and Gomorrah, this ultimate picture of the world, was they 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 ate too much. They were always eating. And so that's something that, that keeps you from these big things. You have to be able to say, God, I'm, I'm going to go after with all my heart and push away every other voice because I need I need to hear from you in this situation right now. Mm. Wow. So God called you to that 40 day mm-hmm. fast. Wow. Yes. Man. Yeah, it catches the attention of God and Bishop Kinsey is is on to it. Right there, that it's Ezekiel of... 16. Yeah, it's Ezekiel 16. Uh, I'll, in fact, I'll just read it for you, for your for your listeners. Yeah, go ahead. It says, Ezekiel chapter 16, um, verse 48. Let's, let's start there. Uh, or I can actually start um, 47. Now it's not walked after their ways, done their abominations. Verse 48 says, As I live, saith the Lord, Sodom thy sister hath not done she nor her daughters as thou hast done and thou and thy daughters behold this was the iniquity of thy sister sodom pride fullness of bread abundance of idleness was in her and her daughters neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy so in other words you know there was just something about uh in fact verse 51 says that they that she justified all those abominations and so these were abominations in, in the sight of god brother gleason yeah overeating was an abomination in the sight of God. It was a signal that you were worldly. It was a signal you that you had Sodom in you when you were in when you were overeating. Mm-hmm. Well, it's no wonder there. The Bible says the the outcry of Sodom came to the Lord. Mm. Man, the world cried mm-hmm. out. There you go. Uh, to wow, Sodom. that's that's yeah. that's. I didn't, I didn't hear that before. That's powerful. Wow, mm-hmm. yeah, that's something. Man, wow. I loved it when you talked about your dad, page 72. Yeah. Uh, I've never met your dad, but I just cried when you talked about mm. some of his personal spiritual disciplines. Yeah. You said that he, for years, has read the Bible through, Genesis to Revelation, the entire Bible through, every 30 days. Every 30 days. I'm not talking every. Three years. Every twelve times a year. Thirty days. Twelve times yes. a year. And every day he goes twelve hours in a day without eating. Every day. So he fasts every day for twelve every day. hours. Yeah. <sighs> okay. So yeah, he's and, done and, the he, did, and he did for that almost forty years. So, so yeah, you saw that growing up. Uh my whole life. I think he did it. I think he started right before I was born. Um, I'll be 39 this month, so almost 40 years. Well, happy he, early um, birthday. Thank you, man. I just turned uh, 39. Hold, it's not bad, man. It's okay, we're holding on. We're going to be in great company. On this one. <laughs> there you go. Well, well All right. he, uh, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, well, um, I, my question is, so you're seven, eight, nine years old, and you, you're mm-hmm. seeing your dad mm-hmm. just devouring the Word of God. Mm-hmm. And fasting every day. What do they call that now? Interment fasting? That's a word for it. The 12 mm-hmm. hour thing. So he, he was fasting. doing it. He was doing it before it got popular. <laughs> Nowadays. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. How did that impact you as, as a kid and teenager? Well, especially the Bible reading. Um, you know, it's about 40 chapters a day that he reads. And, uh, you know, and when the most powerful thing, well, there's so many things, but is it was seeing him on days where we were very busy or he had to preach multiple times and seeing him staying up at night to get the chapters read. And, and I think he said in those almost 40 years, only two days has he not completed his Bible reading. And that was because he had, he deals with very, very, uh, he deals with very strong migraines uh, oh. still to this day. And yet he says two of those times he had extreme migraines and he was very sick throwing up and he did not get to finish his, uh, his 40 chapters, wherever it was. So the next morning he doubled up. 
So two days out of almost 40 years where he did not get his two and a half hours of reading. Another thing that he uh, and that that he does is he he doesn't he doesn't consider listening to it reading. He considers reading reading. And <laughs> I'm with and him so, on it. I can't yeah, do them so, audio bibles. Yeah, can't do yeah. It. So I mean, and so I mean, and I I know, but he. So if he so say he had to read Genesis one through forty, if he listened to Genesis, if he was you know in the car and you had Genesis 10 through 12 on, he didn't, and he listened to it. He would not consider that part of his reading. <laughs> Nothing wrong with it. Yeah. But we don't consider Nothing that wrong reading. with it. No, no, he, <laughs> he, he didn't keep, he does it still to this day, you know? Yeah. And so, uh, very, uh, very intense, um, sets the bar very high. Uh, mm. never, never, never condemning, never tries to put on anybody else. Doesn't never tries to, uh, of course. Uh, yeah. But one thing, you know, I noticed about his prayer life is he said, uh, that he he strongly feels that he'd rather hear from God than God hear from him. So when oh. it comes to the when it oh. comes to the yeah when it comes to the reading, he said, you know, I I read more than I speak because I'd rather hear the voice of God than for God to Jeez. always hear my voice. Mm. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, I can see how that's uh, impacted your uh, fervency yes. uh, for the Lord. Wow. It's, 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 it's something that, you know, when, you know, like I remember one time we, we were married a few months and he came down from Alaska and he, uh, some preachers, some pastors in the area wanted him to preach that Sunday. And they scheduled, he had three different services, a Sunday morning, a Sunday afternoon, and a Sunday night. And I remember thinking to myself, well, he's not going to get his reading done today. He, he, he's not used to three services, you know, on a Sunday. I kind of laughed in my mind. And I'll never forget after the third service, him stopping by the gas station and buying a two liter bottle of Mountain Dew to stay up to get oh, that's cool. 40 chapters read. Yeah. I mean, just like he was not. He, <laughs> he was drank not, the whole thing. Was, <laughs> he kind of probably did, man. I don't know. But I do know I went to bed. He was still reading. You know. Oh, was, man. Uh, wow. Yeah. What a story. Over the level. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, that intense, is just man. Uh, so inspiring. Been doing it for years. <laughs> wow. That is amazing. Yeah, there's, there's not a lot of excuses, you know, you can make when you, when you see someone doing that. You know, uh, there's not a lot of uh, – I don't have a lot of time yeah. for the, the preachers that can't, can't read their Bibles. Uh, and I, I will never be able to do what he does. Uh, he's called to do I, it. Called yeah, he's it. called to do it. But when you tell me you can't, you know, you're you're a man of God, but you're never in the Word of God. I I, I don't want to hear you preach. Yeah, they can't preach. No, you can't, because it's coming from you, not him. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah, reads the Bible through every thirty days. And fasts twelve hours a day. Yeah, one time he was on a fast. In fact, he had never gone. I went forty before he did. So when when I when it really it really jacked him up, and he and so he <laughs> went on. He was he started fasting like crazy, and he did like a twenty eight, a thirty, and uh, he did a forty, and then and then he uh, he was going to go on this one fast. He didn't know how long he was going to go, and so he was seven days into it, and the church. Through a surprise, like pastoral appreciation party for him, and they didn't know he was fasting, and so everyone was like, "We made your favorite meals. Uh, we want you to, you know, eat." And so he was like, oh. "And so he, uh, I mean, this is this is this is so much harder to do. I've never seen anyone do this. He he ate the meal, and then after that meal, he fasted twenty eight more days. <laughs> and when you break a fast, the hardest thing you the hardest thing to do is to go back on it. Like it's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> Your body is just going into feed me and it goes into all kinds of mm-hmm. stuff. Chemicals are being released. And he went, so he went seven, ate a meal unexpectedly. He was going to, he wasn't on, he wasn't being called to a certain fast. He was just trying to get a, get an answer from God. And he fasted seven, ate the meal and then went 28 more days. So he basically went 35 days with one meal. So it was, it was crazy. Oh, man, that's something. Praise God. Wow, yeah. that's neat. Mm-hmm. Your chapter, uh, uh, chapter 11, about secrets about strongholds, mm-hmm. I think is very relatable to what a lot of people have been dealing with for years. Okay. 
What is your definition and examples of a stronghold, and how can fasting tear it down? There's a lot there. You know, the word stronghold means castles in the Greek, stronghold, castle, or fortress. Hmm. And so um, when Paul is describing what a stronghold is, he, he, he starts talking about the mind. As soon as, he's, as soon as he gets done telling you that there are strongholds, uh, he starts telling you, you know, uh, that we, that our weapons are not carnal. They're mighty through God pulling out of strongholds. And they instantly go straight to your brain, casting down imaginations. Every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge that has to do with the mind. The knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So he, he's instantly telling you where the, the, the castle or the stronghold is located. So in other words, hell hell's desire is to is to build a fortress in your head. And ultimately, no matter what Holy Ghost you have, if they can start giving you the orders from the inside by giving you direction and building a fortress in your mind through bitterness or doubt or whatever it is, an addiction, uh, this stronghold will become uh, a fortress inside of you. And so that's why Paul said it's 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 that's why Paul said in Romans, be not conformed to this world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that word renewing means renovation. And so when you uh, renovate uh, a home or whatever, the first step of renovation is usually demolition. You tear down a wall that's in the way of your vision. You tear down an obstacle that's in the way of what you're planning to do. Or you could you could call it a stronghold. You could call it a, something that's there. It's that's got roots. It's in it's and so you have to demolish it to renew or to renovate what you're trying to do. So when you when you have a stronghold in your mind, when you've got a castle being built by hell, uh, in fact, I preached a message called The Secrets About Strongholds. This, this chapter is really from that message. But basically, you know, it's, it's the plan of hell to, to control you from the inside with, with even if you never say the things. So, so there's all kind of things that you have to do, repentance and uh, you know, is is huge when it comes to dealing with someone that's been there a long time, rebuking the thoughts that first come to you, removing them, uh, you know, replacing these thoughts uh, is huge. And then ultimately, you know, it, you start receiving thoughts from God. So God tears down the castle and becomes the king of your mind when you, when you uh, give him your mind. So fasting helps bring down the stronghold because ultimately, the stronghold usually has been there a while and usually is never dealt with and flesh flesh that's never dealt with uh it's just it's just you can't just break it with uh and i love you jesus now i lay me down to sleep prayer uh you don't break the strongholds by praying over your food you 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 break strongholds by starving them mm. You you break the thing that you feed. Now it's so funny because you know you wouldn't think food has anything to do with an addiction or or maybe doubt or anger or bitterness. But ultimately, Bible says that uh, uh, I'm thinking of, of bitterness that a contention that, that when a man is offended, uh, his contentions are like the bars of a castle. The Bible says, uh, and and so yeah. when people when people get get this way. Um, it's almost like uh, their flesh is in such in, in so much control that that and they feed their flesh with all these different thoughts. It's almost like you're not feeding your flesh food, but you're feeding your flesh thoughts of how right you are, how justified you are to feel this way, how everyone's wrong but you, and whatever it is, whatever it is, or maybe it's an addiction, and it's like, well, you know, I just can't conquer this, or it's doubt. You know, food. Uh, Spiritual food is the word of God. That's 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 the word. That's why Jesus said, "Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God." And so, when you begin to yeah. feed your mind the word of God, uh, you you come against the thoughts that Satan was whispered to you, that your flesh has let live inside of you. And so when you start fasting <laughs> and you start pursuing God and you start diving into his word, all of a sudden your thought life, like not to go back to the beginning of our talk, but your thought life changes. 
I mean, you start, you will get convicted of things. You, it's almost like God goes behind the scenes and says, okay, you know what's going on in here. This needs to be cleaned up. This needs to be dealt with. You need to forgive this person. You need to let go of that. That's a grudge. You need to, you need to drop that. You know, you know your real motive over here. When you're doing this over here, you know what your real motive is. And, and those are things that, those are the words of God that only come when you've put something uh, on your, from your flesh on the altar. So the greatest way to do that is to fast. And, and when you start to get down to the crevices of your life and, and the issues in your heart, um, it's amazing how, how fasting will bring those issues to the altar and will, will kill them. Fasting will kill those things that are absolutely uh, living in you that no one knows about, but yet you know about Jesus. and God knows about and Satan knows about them. And so when you, when you start fasting about it, yeah, I, I read a book. I forget who wrote. Um, I want to say it was uh, Dr. Franklin Hall who wrote several books on fasting in the 1940s. But he said something. He said uh, someone said they couldn't fast because they got angry when they fast. They, they would lose their temper. And he said uh, the fasting's not making you angry. The fasting's exposing the anger that's living inside of you. That's the truth. Fasting exposes what's hidden in your spirit, not to others, but to you. And you're, you'll be so convinced. Oh, my goodness. You know, that that road rage, that that whatever that is, that struggle, that's 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 living in you. And fasting brings it to the surface. And so it forces it to be dealt with. It forces the renovation, the transformation of your mind. And so I really think that if you really have any kind of. You know, if it's doubt, fear, anxiety, depression, anger, lust, whatever it is, fast about it. I mean, you might not like how you feel the first couple of days. It's going to rear its ugly head. It's going to it's going to it's going to frustrate you. It's going to be it's going to show up. You know, you know, uh, fasting just makes things show up. But, you know, if you just keep fasting. You will weaken that thing. But the Stone King always said fasting weakens the devil. And so when stuff's coming to you from the devil and building that fortress and you start fasting, you're tearing brick by brick. When I say brick by brick, thought by thought, uh, layer by layer, stronghold by stronghold, things that have had access to you that you've firmly not let go of for years start weakening. And then ultimately you're a different person when you're done fasting. Mm. And a fast may just be the very thing that could heal people with mental struggles. It, uh, well, I mean, it did the man. I mean, I believe that, uh, of course, there's people in the Bible, you know, that, that you could say, well, I'm not sure they fasted or not. But we, we do know that when Jesus fasted 40 days and then when he went to the man of Gadara, this is where the, the demons were inside the man. And this is where he said some things go up by, by prayer and fasting. Uh, we know that that man, when he came, when the Lord delivered him, the Bible said was clothed in his right mind. So something about Jesus saying this stuff only comes out by fasting. He's talking about mental. He's talking about these what we'd call mental illness. These are demons. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I that's how I feel about it. These are spirits that that. Uh, mm. Anyway, they, these are spirits that that get medicine and. And uh, they they literally and I'm not saying every time, but there's a lot of times when it's a demon. And Jesus said, if you want this stuff where you want to see these mental breakthroughs take place, where the demons that are controlling someone's mind flee and this person that goes from crazy to normal fast. I, I'm going to tell you a story that's not in the book. There is a there. I don't think anyway, there is. I remember years ago doing uh, preaching a Spanish service with a with with a, a missionary who was interpreting for me from South America. And he told me this story with the Gleason. You're going to want to hear this. Tell he it. said there was a, there's a pastor in South America. And this is 12, 15 years ago. I don't know if he's still alive. That was notorious for praying and fasting. Some, we, we wouldn't know his name. I still don't know his name, but they said, this man said to me, this missionary said, this pastor is known in South America because he uh, fasts and prays, but he he sees sicknesses in people and he'll walk up and pray for them and they'll be healed. And, and I saw it's cool. He said, no, you don't understand what I mean. He said at our at our camp meeting last year, 
he walked up to a, a girl who was mentally retarded and 10 years old. And when he walked up to her, the parents said, what are you doing? He said, I see a black vein in her forehead. And they said, what? There's no black vein. He said, there's a black vein in her forehead. There was no visible black vein. He walked up and said, I command that vein to disappear. And she looked at her mom and dad and began to talk to them completely normal, instantly. Whoa. Instantly mm. was healed. Jeez. I've seen kids that were autistic receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And when they were, I'm talking about they couldn't dress themselves and to be held down on the bed to get dressed. Mm. 10, 12 years old, get the Holy Ghost and instantly be normal. Wow. I remember in Atlanta, Brother John's, there's a healing, go, there's a, oh, there's a, yeah, it is. There's a, there's a healing going on of a little boy right now in Atlanta. He's about six years old. His name is Ronan Jones. And about a year ago, I went there and I was walking out after the first service. They had two morning services and the grandpa grabbed me and said, would you pray for my grandson? He has never spoken a word and uh, autism has never spoken a word. Mm. and I turned, said, sure. And so I prayed and I instantly saw the mom, just her face was just releasing so much doubt and so much pain. And so I just laid hands on her and, and spoke peace and said, okay, Ronan, I command you to speak and open, Lord, open this young man's mouth and every spirit holding him back, remove it. He just looked at me, nothing happened. The next day they sent me the video He's in class and, and they're showing something on the screen and naming the colors. And he opens his mouth and starts naming the colors. <laughs> and every time oh. I've gone back there, they've asked me to pray for him. And they tell me about the progress. This time, he's, he's saying, I love you, Brother Herring. He's, he, he told the doctor, hello, Dr. So-and-so. He's saying, I, uh, good night, Mom and Dad. It's every time I go pray, there's a, there's a progression. There's new words. <laughs> oh, wow. Yes. And so I believe glory to God. I, yes. And the Lord, I mean, only God can do this. You know, I remember Brother Gleason, a story. I remember, I hope I'm not boring you guys with this. Just, there's just uh, stuff's coming to me. But Absolutely I not. Time. This is okay. Okay. intriguing. Uh, you, you just tell me, How? tell me when I need it. Move no, on. Tell it. Uh, okay. I remember being in, um, in Florida and I remember a service of Sunday night and, um, uh, a man walked in, and I never, I had never seen him at this church before. I preached lots of times. Probably mid forties. He had two earrings in his left ear. Uh, he was, uh, I want to say, he was Hispanic. Hispanic. He uh, was on the front row. He was deaf, and the girl was doing sign language for him the entire service. At the end of the service, we were praying for miracles, and I went over and I laid my hands on him, prayed, nothing happened. Uh, I walked away and was trying to pray for others. And the Lord said, go back. So I went back and I put my fingers in his ears this time and said, Lord, open these ears. And nothing happened. I walked away. The Lord said, go back. And I said, okay, well, I've gone twice, God, and you've done nothing. So I went back and I prayed again, Lord, heal him and, and, and open these ears. Nothing happened. And I walked away and when I walked away. God said, it's a spirit. Mm. He said, you're praying for him to be healed when it's a demon. He needs to be delivered. And I thought, wait a second. I, thought, I remember where, when one time in the Bible, there was a deaf person and Jesus said, come out thou dumb and deaf spirit. Yes. And so now sometimes it's physical, but, but sometimes it's spiritual. Yeah, demons and can so do I look, stuff. Yes. It, and so I thought, well, let's just see. So I turned and I said, come out thou deaf spirit. And when I did, he instantly, and I'm not trying to make it gross on the call, but he started dry heaving into his hands for 30 minutes mm -hmm. one person said they counted that he 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 dry heaved and vomited 500 times in 30 minutes mm -hmm. when he got done 30 minutes he fell to the ground and they back up because i told him i tried everything i told him to take his earrings out i mean I, I was going after him and he fell to the ground and when he did he he did something in sign language he started moving his hands he was talking to the girl and i said wait what's he saying and she said he's saying the torment and the gnawing and the screaming is gone and i said then lord and i put my fingers in his ears and i said lord 
if the spirit is gone, open his ears that he might hear. And instantly he began to scream. I can hear, I can hear, I can hear. The demons had left and the there's an angel in this room right now. The Lord had instantly made him whole. And so sometimes it's, it's not what you think it is. You know, it's, it, it, it might pose as a mental illness. It might pose as anxiety or fear. It's a spirit lurking in your house that needs to be spoken to. Victory is a decision. You have the Holy Ghost. You are a child of God. You've been baptized in the name of Jesus. Victory is not a fight. It's a decision. You wake up and you can decide, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have depression or I'm going to have victory. I can be, I can live in anxiety or I can live in authority because you have the real thing. It's just a decision. You have to receive it. Mm. Jesus name. You start fasting, you'll see stuff like that. Yes, you will. Wow. Awesome. At the close of this podcast, go to Amazon and get your copy a fast forward by Brother Josh Herring. It will speak to you. It will change your life. You'll receive direction. You'll receive power. Amen. In Jesus' name. Brother Herring, you've mentioned a couple of your messages. You okay. also preached not too long ago at General Conference 2021 on Friday night. Our movement is on a mission. And uh, I listened to that. Well, actually, oh, watched it, and it was awesome, bro. What a word! You, You're kind. I would have loved to have been there, but as you know, we had a baby. You know, we had a we had a baby that you know mm-hmm. that was. Uh, my wife was close to delivering our our third son. Remember, and, remember that. Yeah, so that's why we weren't there, but we were cheering you on through the internet. <laughs> um. A phenomenal message. Would you mind telling us about your just your you know, preaching general conference? Is I, I can only imagine. I've heard my dad talk about it, but tell us about your experience leading up to the service and what was it like preaching it and what what followed. Okay. Well, um, I got the uh, your dad was the one that let me know, and then uh, it was it was going to happen. It was in March and. Um, was going to happen in October, I believe. Yeah, October 8th. And um, so I instantly had several months to, you know, be nervous and and, and stress and all these things. And so a few months had gone by and I had not heard from the Lord. And, uh, you know, I had people tell me, well, it's going to be one of your messages that you preach. You know, you're going to preach and walk off the platform and you're going to know this is it. I had people tell me, you know, the day, the day, the day before you get there, the Lord will drop it in your spirit. And, and uh, I, I, I wanted to hear from God. So I just, I just did what I, I know to do. I went on a fast and I, I wasn't a long fast. It was like six days, no, seven days. But on the sixth night, the Lord began to tell me uh, all these things what to preach. And he, he began to just reveal all these things in the book of Nehemiah to me. And, and he told me the one thing he said was, do not preach this before general conference. Mm. I don't know if I'll ever preach it again. I don't think I will. I mean, I might use points in the message in other messages, but I won't probably ever preach that message ever again. Uh, it was, it was a one-time deal. I mean, unless God changes it somehow, but it, it was, it was, it was on a fast that he gave it to me. It was very clear. I wept for hours. Now, so I knew I had the word. Then came the attacks. Um, my body started having, uh, uh, I started having chest pains. I started having um, something go wrong one day. My, 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 my body was aching. My, and I had this, uh, I had this weightlifting injury where I had, I, I didn't know what was wrong, but every time I turned my head left, uh, I had this, what I call like a lightning tremor go across the front of my head on the right side above my Mm. eye, like a lightning strike. And it it had been going on for a couple of months. Uh, You know, it started off with, you know, three or four times a day. Then it was about 10 times a day. Then it got up to about 150 to 200 times a day to the point where if I turned my head left at all, 
there was a lightning strike going across my face, across my forehead, and then my chest was hurting. And so it was so severe one day that I thought, uh, something's wrong. I, I need to have this thing checked out. Maybe I've got a, you know, a herniated disc. And so I went to a chiropractor. They couldn't figure it out. They, 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 they said, we don't know what it is. And it's okay. So anyway, I started having, uh, it started getting so bad. I ignored the chest pain. I started having this just absolute ridiculous struggle to even barely, I, it got to the point where the Gleason where if I turned my eyes left, I looked left without even moving my head. I was oh. having these, and I was getting a little nervous. So we had this uh, urgent care hospital clinic uh, down the road. Which was, it's actually a hospital. And so I, I told my wife that I don't, I don't do this kind of stuff, but I'm going to, I'm going to go because I, I think I, you know, I got something wrong here. It's getting, I can't even look, look turn my eyes left. So I went in and the first thing they did, if they checked my pulse and my heart rate was, they said, do you have a living will? And I said, uh, why? They said, if you don't fill it out immediately, your blood pressure is way above stroke level. Oh. Um, and we're not letting you go anywhere. We're not, we could care less about your lightning strikes in your head. Something's wrong with your heart. And so they began to do test after test after test, uh, seven hours worth of tests. I mean, it was every kind of test. I know for a fact that I got the bill for all of them and they, they just tested me. They tested. Well, so, so they didn't give me any answer. They, 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 we have to another test, another test. Well, finally the doctor came in and I was sitting there like, you know, my pulse rate would not go down. It would stay at 110. Like, like you were you know, walking briskly or maybe a slight jog, but I was laying still. I had been laying still for hours, seven hours. It was so high. And the doctor said to me, can I ask you what you do? And I said, yes, ma'am, I'm a preacher. She said, well, that makes sense because this is a spiritual attack. There's nothing wrong with your heart. Now, a doctor at a hospital. For the mm. And I said, I said, what? what? And she said to me, and I, this is what this, my jaw hit the floor. She said to me, this reminds me of a preacher who fell over dead in Australia. And he was dead for 45 minutes. His name was uh, Stone King. Have you heard of him? Mm. My, I didn't know what to say. I just looked at her. I said, he just texted me 20 minutes ago. She said, N no, this man, it's, it's, a, it's a YouTube. I said, Yes, it's, it is, his name is Lee Stone King. She didn't know what to do. And so she walked out of the room. Instantly, someone came back in and said, we're getting ready to release you. There's something wrong with your heart. My pulse rate went down instantly. When that doctor walked away, someone walked in the room and erased the name of the doctor on the marker board and said these words to me. That was not your doctor tonight. You had a different doctor and walked out. Whoa. That's all they said. I, I can't tell you if it was an angel of the Lord. Your dad believes it was an angel of the Lord. I, I believe it was an angel of the Lord. It was, just, it, was, it was too real. She knew the details about the Stone King. She was letting me know you're going to be okay. And I knew it was connected when I walked out of that hospital. I knew it was connected to the general conference. I knew it was an attack for what God was going to release. So, so when that night came, mm. I, I fully believed that heaven had spoken to me. God has given me his word and hell had attacked me. And you had spoken to me such clear words of, of, of you gave me so much insight of what was going to happen in the conference. The Lord gave you such clarity. Mm. I had peace because I had heard from God. I had fought the devil and I had heard from a prophet. And I knew that God's will was going to be done. And bro, it, the Lord, he did it. It was awesome. He moved in a mighty way. It was fun. It was Praise fun. Glad it's over. Wow. And you had to pay quite a price for it. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and oh, by the way, let me just back up. When I left there, I never had had, I've had one or two of those little tremors, uh, but it was nothing to, I don't know, it, those instantly stopped. I mean, 150 to 200 a day, instantly gone. Jesus name. Wow. Yeah, spiritual. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't realize what us men of God have to go through. You know, no. You're not supposed no. to. 
But no. thank you for being so transparent about that. Even mentioning that you were nervous mm-hmm. about it. You know, people think we don't get nervous. Oh, we still get nervous. <laughs> oh yeah, we're human. We we get <laughs> we get nervous. We worry about what's going to go yeah. wrong, and then sometimes we suffer. Yeah. Uh, so much, but the Lord helps us. So that's why you got to pray for your pastors and your evangelists. Amen. Fast for them. Amen. Man. You know, earlier in the, and we were talking, you mentioned Brother Stone King, Brother Willoughby. Ever since you said those names, I got real melancholy mm-hmm. thinking about them. Yeah. So have you talked to Brother Stone King recently? I have not spoken to him in the last couple months. I, he did try to, I, I think he accidentally called me the other day because it, it rang. <laughs> it, was a face, it was a FaceTime call, and he's never FaceTimed me, and it rang for like three seconds and then stopped. And so I was with the kids, and I thought, you know, I mean, he'll, he never called back. So I, I, I should probably call, but I have not spoken to him in the last couple months. No, it's been, it's been a crazy season. Yeah, he's just I've gotten a few texts from him on the text thread. He seems yeah. to be doing well and very happy. As far as I know, he's, awesome. he's, he's stayed put. Yeah. You know, during all of this, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you're smart. Mm-hmm. You know, so, <laughs> some people have done every, every everything the, the medical community, the government has said to do against this against mm-hmm. this virus. Some of us have just ate correctly, getting yeah. enough sleep, good nutrition, exercised, and uh, stayed Sunlight. away from people. <laughs> <That's pretty laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. He's done a, an excellent job of that. Yeah. Yeah. Brother Hand, did yeah. you ever get to meet Brother Steve Willoughby, Missionary Willoughby? Um, you know, he um, he smiled at me in a service one time, but I didn't get to talk to him. Hmm. So no, I I know you did, right? I got. Yeah, he came through Kansas City a couple times. Hmm. He was. Uh, it was the real day. One of the best. Oh, my word. <laughs> One of the best. What a man oh, of God. Oh, man. Is, if you, if, uh, not to give him a plug, but there's a, there's a message on YouTube called Early Morning Prayer. It's like seven or eight clips of him. He's at, it's at CLC in Stockton, and he's just talking about what? when, when, when he, when, and I'm when he, he was, yeah, when he's not, he wasn't a morning guy, and God told him to meet him. 40 days in a row before sunrise. And uh, it's, 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 it, it's in like 10 minute clips. There's like seven of them. It's, it's called early morning prayers. Steve Willoughby. It's one of the, I've watched it so many times. It's one of the greatest. Uh, it's one of the greatest. You, you'll, you'll, you there's impartations coming out of his pores, you know, Jesus. his prayer life comes, comes through, comes through the screen. So yeah, I, I recommend that to anybody who wants to pray in the morning. Mm. I've never seen that one. I've watched a lot of mm. the Willoughby. Yeah, he's preaching. Really prayer. Yeah, he's going to check awesome. that out. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Again, Brother Herring, congratulations on the book. Thank Last you. Last question. Uh, I mean, this book's phenomenal. It's a it's a great read. You're a phenomenal <laughs> writer, and I I never thought anybody could make fasting uh, <laughs> so, so uh, intriguing. And let me tell you, this is the first fasting book I've ever read. I've listened to a lot wow. of great preaching about fasting. Never read a book. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like specifically for fasting. Right. fasting. Mm-hmm. So I get the feeling this is not going to be your only book. You've already got your mind on writing some other things. Do you have any ideas on what we can expect from you as an author in the future? Thank you. Uh, your words are so kind, man. Um, my next book is Lord willing going to be a book on prayer patterns. Uh, I want I want to, I want to, uh, I'm not sure what I'll title it, maybe prayer patterns or, or something in the prayer closet, but I want to dive into all the different types of praying you can do for the different seasons that you're in. Uh, prayers that get answers, prayers that build your relationship. Um, I go through seasons where it's different types of praying, uh, but that's something that I want to, uh, to write. Uh, I want to write a book about praying. Uh, to motivate, to inspire, uh, to help people uh, that can't seem to get their prayer life going, uh, that relationship with God. Um, I want to help people um, work on that and develop that. And then, Hmm. um, you know, and then ultimately, uh, you know, there's people in the Bible that, you know, we all, 
all preachers love to preach about and people that seem to connect. And I, I seem to connect with different people in the Bible, but I, I'd love to uh, write a book about um, uh, discipline and Joseph and just the life uh. of how, how to get your dreams unlocked, how to, how to go from dreaming uh, into your destiny and the, the pathway of, uh, you know, of, of, of getting your dreams uh on the table with God and to where they actually manifest. And it's not just some pie in the sky idea, but you're actually living uh, what you once dreamed. And so there are some, there's uh, got uh, several chapters ready for both. I just gotta, I just have to have the time, you know, to get this going, but those are the two, uh, you know, I strongly recommend to people. I told someone this today, you know, uh, guys like you, Brother Gleason, you're so gifted. And this podcast is just proof, uh, be, you know, beyond your natural anointing as a prophet. But people like you and others that I've, that I've talked to that are very gifted, you know, I strongly encourage you to pray about writing something. Because, um, you know, I write, I write in a prayer journal every morning. And so, someone asked me today, why do you do that? And I said, it's for my kids. And uh, they said, what do you mean? I said, in fact, in the beginning of my prayer journals, I write a note to my kids. It's it's for when I'm gone. It's in fact, the last words are I'll, I'll, I'll see you in heaven. Mm. And it's 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 patterns of prayer. It's different seasons of my prayer life where you can see I'm doing this prayer, this certain type of prayer for these certain amount of days. And then you see it shift and you see it on the pages. You see this the shifting of the way I pray on the pages and. And even if you don't write a book, just writing in a journal uh, is so healthy for you. Write down the Amen. verses that jump off the pages of the Bible to you. Even if you type them in your phone, I, you, don't, you don't have to write them in a journal. I physically write them with a pen in a journal, but you, you can type them on, you know, on your computer or your phone. But get into the habit of writing, uh, journaling. That's probably what led me to writing this book was journaling uh, prayers. And so I just strongly encourage people that, that uh, you know, and you are just one, but you're, you're so many things, so much insight in the spirit world. You know, if you, if you wrote a book on, on, on just the spirit world and just the things, you know, the, the types, the shadows, the, the signals, the different things, the, what things mean. I mean, I would, I wouldn't just buy it and read it. I would be promoting it everywhere because it's so needed right now. And you're an expert on the subject. And so You've lived it. You've, you've, you've again. So my, my thought is this, when God let me fast, uh, all those long fasts and, and, and it's still not done. More is coming here pretty soon. Um, I, my desire is that, you know what, this needs to get contagious. And that, I shouldn't use that word in today's world, but this, this needs to, this needs to spread. We need, we need people to start, to, to start doing this. We don't need a few people that, you know, know the power of it. We need we need this to go across the world and and let people see what God can do in their personal lives. It's a weapon. It's a weapon. It's wisdom. It's I mean, the book may not be wisdom, but it's it's just having insight to how to fight the enemy. So if you, for instance, wrote a book on spiritual warfare, I mean, it would it would change thousands and thousands of people's lives, man. And so I just I just encourage you. I encourage others that you know. Uh, you know, consider writing. We we, we want to hear it, <laughs> and so man, please put it on put it on some pages so we could see it. And this, uh, I'll tell you, your book in, did inspire me to write. I appreciate all the kind words you and I. Uh, this this recording is just only a little small glimpse of the, some of the great yeah. conversations you and I have had. Yeah, and uh, I tell you, I if in, if COVID did anything for me, it kind of got me out of my shell a little bit to start mm. talking about my experiences and things that I've seen and known. And um, yeah, wow. man, I I do want to write books. I'm looking over here. I've got I've got my journal right now, and you know, it's something I, I write to my kids <laughs> mm -hmm. and, my, and, and my wife. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, I write a lot to people that uh, are so dear to me and write down what I'm thinking mm -hmm. and feeling. And it is very healthy. Yeah, I it do. Is. I do want to write a book. I sure do. Wow. There's something about seeing the notes. You know, I have, I have, and I've shared these with you, but you know, I've had some, some of Billy Cole's notes, handwritten yeah. messages he preached. You know, when you have those notes, it's like, there's something that's just, it's just a treasure. It's just, this is, it's still alive. You know, you read the word of God every day. 
<laughs> it's because the words are still alive. You know, the words are still talking to you. So, you know, I, I mean, I think that, you know, you can live on through something you write and no matter, no matter how long or short, yeah, it's permanent. How long, short or long your life is there's, you know, as people can look back to the Lord Terry and, 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 you know, should he tarry several years from now and say, okay, look, there's a, uh, there's a book on fasting. So who this guy was, you know, when I, when I started reading these books on fasting, this guy that wrote all these books in the forties, he's dead now. I mean, he wrote several different little books. You, you, you can't just find, you know, look for them. And it's like, wow, this guy, this guy was doing these hardcore water only, you know, for, there was one lady in one of his books I mean, it's like uh, she was like 70 something years old. She fasted 83 days with water, 83 days in a row with water. And she 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 drank a, a sip of tomato, uh, tomato soup or tomato juice. And she spit it out because she thought she was breaking a fast. Goodness. And she was so, it was just like stories of like these are people that live in the 30s and 40s. And you're like and then all these little testimonials of all these people that and fasted i mean just intense man intense, intense working yeah working cr crazy jobs and and yet doing it so we can do it man we just, and it's just awesome that someone wrote it down and and um and let us have access to it so praise god yeah amen wow for the hearing close us out would you please pray over the listeners that god would move upon them speak to them inspire them to fast by the authority of the word of God and the power of the name of the Lord Jesus, I release the spirit of fasting across these airwaves right now for every person that you're calling, every person that needs an answer, every person that needs a miracle, every person that needs a direction, every yes. person that has a situation that they cannot solve on their own with their connections, their resources, their intelligence, their ability, their finances. I speak right now fast and fall upon them. Give them a date when to start. Give them amount of time. Let them go to their pastor and get the fast covered by their shepherd. And I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you for answered prayers. I thank you for years of rewards that are coming. For I know the one thing about long fast, God, and that is you give years of rewards yes. for lengthy fasting. Let the rewards begin. Let the answered prayers begin. Let the tide shift and let the season change. And I pray for those that are in despair and depression and in the darkness to fast their way out of the cave mm. and to see that you're not through with them and you're not done with them. Let the light begin to shine in 2022. Let answers begin to come. I speak life in Jesus' name to every listener. It's time. It's line. It's time to yes. launch the fast in Jesus' name. John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Baptism, then what? Baptism is a burial in water for accountable beings into the remission of sins, for salvation to get into Christ, to become a new creature, to get into the one body. Then, walk in the new life, study and grow, become a servant of righteousness, keep self pure, be an example, have faith in God, follow Jesus, put first things first, Resist temptation, be faithful, and be fruitful. 
Baptism is done to wash away our sins, Acts 22, 16. Baptism is done to be reborn to new life, John 3, 5, Romans 6, 3 through 6. Baptism is done to clothe ourselves with Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27.